Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Genesis. Genesis, of course, in Greek means beginnings, so this is the book of the beginnings, and we are now up to the point where we're talking about Jacob. Jacob the Supplanter is the name of this lesson. It's a lesson for Num lesson number nine for May 28th of 2022. And as usual, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Father, we recognize that these people that we're studying lived a long time ago and their culture and their situation was quite different than ours. But help us to understand what was going on and what we can learn from their experiences. We thank you for the incredible way in which you blessed them and looked after them. And may we pray, pray for that kind of care for us when the time of trouble comes is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this lesson will focus on some of the very dysfunctional aspects of Isaac's family and also Laban's family for that matter. Esau and Jacob were already fighting in Rebekah's womb, and you notice that there's more than one way to spell Rebecca, so you can take your choice there. We start off with Genesis 25, 21 to 26 to give us an introduction to this story, and, and to be honest, let's be, be fair, this entire lesson is basically a long story. So you're gonna hear a lot of sort of stories here as we move along. Jim? Because Rebecca had no children, Isaac prayed to the Lord for her. And I, let me just interrupt there for a second. They had been married 20 years already, no children. Why did Isaac pray for Rebecca? Why didn't Rebecca pray for Rebecca? Well, maybe she did too, but... Uh, it wasn't recorded. Good question. Go ahead. The Lord answered his prayer and Rebecca became pregnant. She was going to have twins and before they were born, they struggled against each other in her womb. She said, why should something like this happen to me? So she went back to ask the Lord for an answer. So you see, she went to the Lord also. The Lord said to her, two nations are within you. You will give birth to two rival peoples. One will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt and ask Myra a question. How would you like to have two nations struggling in your womb? <laughs> <laughs> She's told me it was tough enough with one. That's right. Yeah, exactly. One at a time, that is. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. The time came for her to give birth, and she had twin sons. The first one was reddish. His skin was like a hairy robe, so he called his name Esau. The second one was born holding it on tightly to the heel of Esau. So I, I, I've always wondered about that. A newborn holding on tightly to the heel of his... Okay, go ahead. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. American Bible Society, 1992, Good News Translation. It's interesting that they would tend to name him. Now you could understand why they would say this guy's name is Esau because he has sort of looked red, but, uh, or hairy, um, but calling somebody a supplanter because he's holding on to his brother's heel as they are being born? That sounds pretty way out to me. What about the description of Jacob and Esau in Romans 9 in predestination? Now we're gonna jump way over to the end of the story just so that you can get a, an overall picture of how this story is understood in some places. Carrie? Right, Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. And this is not all. For Rebekah's two sons had the same father, our ancestor Isaac. But in order that the choice of one son might be completely the result of God's own purpose, God said to her, the elder will serve the younger. He said this before they were born, because before they had done anything either good or bad. So God's choice was based on his call and not on anything they had done. As the scripture says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. And that's from the Good News Bible. Whoa. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, many Christians read the brief account of this story in Romans 9, 10 to 13, and this is a problem. It's especially a problem for those Christians who think that they should only read the New Testament. So they don't have the Old Testament background to help them understand this story. So they read it, conclude that God predestines people and that we and they have no choice in the matter. This is a serious misreading of Romans. One needs to go back to the Old Testament and review the context of the quotations used by Paul to see this error in understanding. God did indeed say that Esau and his descendants would serve Jacob and his descendants. That was God's choice. However, this was not a moral matter taking away anyone's freedom. The verse stating from, that God loved Jacob and hated Esau is quoted from Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3, and was written hundreds of years. Uh, let's see, let, let's think about that for a moment. This would be about uh, 16 or 1700 years, maybe 1800 years, before Ma Malachi wrote it. No, I'm sorry, about 1400 years before Malachi wrote it. And so they were long dead when this was, statement was made. So it was written hundreds of years after the events of Jacob and Esau. When this statement was written, the descendants of Esau were conquered several different times, were finally completely overrun by the Nabataeans in about 300 BC. Thus, this statement was merely a record of what had already taken place and not a prediction or a predestination of what was to take place. Any questions about that? really important to know the historical Old Testament history so you don't get messed up with that. From birth onward, however, the twin brothers were not alike. Duane? Oh, the contrast between the two brothers is immediately fulfilled in their behavior and choices. Like Ishmael, Esau is a skillful hunter, a man who loves to be outdoors in the open fields whereas Jacob is a mild man who prefers dwelling at home. Esau is loved by his father, while Jacob is loved by his mother. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. I'm getting really good at interrupting here. Notice that expression, Jacob is a mild man. We'll come to that in a little bit. Go ahead. The spiritual and sensitive nature of Jacob contrasts with the tough and physical nature of Esau. The Hebrew word tam translated mild, which qualifies Jacob, is the same word that characterizes Job and Noah. Likewise, the verb yeshab, translated dwelling, meaning sitting, suggests the quiet and meditative temperament of Jacob. This information regarding their characters anticipates the incident of the meal, which will determine their respective priorities. Jacob has considered the spiritual significance of the birthright that he wants to passionately obtain, that he wants so passionately to obtain. Esau, in contrast, does not concern himself with things beyond the present life and is not interested in what could take place after his death. Unlike Esau, who is present-oriented, Jacob is future-oriented and particularly sensitive to spiritual values, and yet is so eager to secure the birthright at this moment that he uses material means for that purpose. Ironically, Jacob has enough faith to see spiritual values and the future profit of a birthright, but not enough faith to trust God for it. Before the institution of the priesthood, the birthright included not only an inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual <coughs> preeminence. He who received it was to be priest of his family. And that's from Ellen White's Patriarchs and Prophets, page 177. Go ahead. So that's just the last sentence was from yeah. Patriarchs and Prophets. Yes. Esau's request in Genesis 25, 30 suggests that for him, the birthright had no spiritual significance. He was concerned only with his immediate gratification. Thus, he despised his birthright. Yeah, and there's references for that. That's from the, taken from our Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. And here's the word, we mentioned the word world, the word mild. Look what it says with reference to Job. Then the Lord said to Jay, well, go ahead, Myra, and then I'll, I'll talk about it. Job 1, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? 
that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So now the same, the same word here translated blameless is the one that's used to describe Jacob as being mild. Okay, read the next one. This is Job uh, chapter 8, verse 20. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. And again, there's the word blameless from the same Hebrew word. Okay. Then from Genesis 6, verse 9, there are the generations of Noah. Noah was just was a just man and perfect in his in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Okay, the word perfect in his generations from the same word. So you can see, and we need to understand that Hebrew is an ancient, ancient language. This pre, you know, exile way back there Hebrew um, was, the, 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 the vocabulary was quite limited. So each word was used for a, a wide number of, of purposes. So mild, blameless, perfect, all was the same word. Perfect, righteous. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know whether, no, there's a different word for righteous, but similar. Well, it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. like I, I learned years ago, the word asa or asa, A-S-A-8, mm -hmm. in, into English, it, it could translate from that one Hebrew word at least 75 different English words. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes I've seen as many as a phrase, eight letters, excuse me, eight words long come out of one Hebrew yeah. word. Well, so even in English where we have lots of words, yeah. we still use the same word for different meanings. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you, we need to be aware that in English there are, I've forgotten the exact figure, but something like 1,500 different root words. And compared, and that's by far more than any other language, it's because we've just adopted things for so many other languages. French, which comes the closest, is, has about 300,000. I mean, 15, we have 1.5 million. French has 300,000. And then you go to like one of, some of the African languages, they have two or 3,000, maybe, maybe 5,000 words altogether. So you have to use one word for a lot of different things. And Hebrew is similar. And Hebrew and ancient Hebrews, it was very limited. Yeah. Okay. And then the language was dead. How many years yeah. before? And then tried to resurrect the thing. And yeah. And start adding a whole bunch of new words to it. I'm going to go back just a little bit. I understand the different words and the different, you know, understandings of why. I don't understand, I should say. Um, but Esau and Jacob, why did God not just have Jacob be born first? Yes, that's a very good question. A very good question. Because the devil got there first. Do we say well, that, we, do we say that uh, for, uh, in today's language when people, twins are born or quadruplets or... Uh, why, why can't we just, that's the way it worked out? Yeah. Why does God have to be, be manipulate something? Well, it's, it's not, not saying that God has to manipulate something. That's just what they did. That was a custom, the firstborn. Well, the real reason, and, and of course we've talked about this before, the real reason was, in, in, in general, when there's one child born at a time, in the ancient custom, the eldest son was responsible for the parents when they got elderly. That's why they gave him a double portion, wasn't Yeah, it? so he gets a double portion. He's also supposed to be the priest of the family. And those are the two things that normally went with being the firstborn. And it's but, still that way in some cultures too. It's yeah. still that way in some cultures. So, uh, why? Yeah. Why, why didn't God? The challenge and, comes, of course, when you have twins. Yeah. But the, there's also the comments, you know, that Jacob was loved by his mother and Esau by his father. I mean, I have three children and I can't say... I love one more than the other. I mean, I like certain traits, of, but... Yeah, exactly. Well, Esau demonstrated the fact that his vision was only for the present and his physical enjoyment. On the other hand, Jacob was more concerned about the future blessing, not even the blessing coming to him personally, but to his posterity. Gordon? Hebrews 12, 16 to 17. Let no one become 
immoral, or unspiritual like Esau, who for a single meal sold his rights as the elder son. Afterwards, you know, <clears throat> he wanted to receive his father's blessing, but he was turned away because he could not find any way to change what he had done, <clears throat> even though in tears he looked for it. The conflict enhanced. Think about how they were born. Now, the conflict enhanced when Esau came home very hungry and agreed to sell his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. This familiar story is found in Genesis 25, 27 to 34. Um, maybe we should just go ahead and look at that. I think we're going to have time, hopefully. Esau sells his birthright. The boys grew up and Esau became a skilled hunter, a man who loved the outdoor life. But Jake was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac preferred Esau because he enjoyed eating the animals Esau killed. But Rebecca preferred Jacob. One day while Jacob was cooking some bean soup, Esau came in from hunting. He was hungry and said to Jacob, I'm starving. Give me some of that red stuff. That is why he was called Edom. Jacob answered, I will give it to you if you'll give me your rights as their firstborn son. Esau said, all right, I'm about to die. What good will my rights do me then? Jacob answered, first make a vow that you will give me your rights. Esau made, a, made the vow and gave his rights to Jacob. Then Jacob uh, gave some, him some bread and some of the soup. He ate and drank and then got up and left. And left. That was all Esau cared about the sign about his rights as the firstborn son. Oh, wow. About the spiritual rights as well as the physical, yeah. as well as Especially the... Especially this, did he, he, he didn't care about the spiritual rights. We do not know exactly at what point this event took place. We do, what we do know is that at the age of 40, Esau chose to marry two Hittite women who made the lives of Isaac and Rebekah miserable. Sometime after that experience, we have these two notes about Esau and his wives. Jim, you want to... Pick that up there, Genesis 26, uh, verses 34 and 35. When Esau was 40 years old, he married two Hittite women, Judith, the daughter of Bere, and Basemeth, the daughter of Elon. They made the miserable, excuse me, they made life miserable for Isaac and Rebekah. Good news, Bible. And then later... Genesis uh, chapter 27, verse 46. Rebekah said to Isaac, I am sick and tired of Esau's foreign wives. If Jacob also marries one of these Hittite women, I might as well die. Wow. How would you really feel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not knowing that Esau had sold his birthright to Jacob. This is incredible. Uh, apparently not knowing that Esau had sold his birthright to Jacob and about 30... About 30 years after Esau had married these two women, they're now 70, the twins are now 70, Isaac at the age of 130 and blind called Esau and asked him to get some wild game and prepare it for him so that he could bless Esau with the birthright. This familiar story is found in Genesis 27. We're not going to take time to read that whole story, but Carrie? The promises made to Abraham and confirmed to his son were held by Isaac and Rebekah as the great object of their desires and hopes. With these promises, Esau and Jacob were familiar. They were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance, for it included not only an inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family, and in the line of his posterity, the Redeemer of the world would come. That's from Ellen White's Patriarchs and Prophets, page 177, paragraph 3. Wow. I, I recently thought about it and meditated on this some and wondered, what would you think if someone told you, someone who knew what they were talking about told you, one of your descendants is going to be the son of God. Yeah. Son of man and son of God. How would you be able to wrap your yeah. head around that? It's just... Well, these problems and differences of opinion led to the great deception of Isaac. And now let's talk about the, that. Twain? Esau did not tell his father that he had sold his birthright to Jacob and confirmed it with an oath. And I'm going to ask a question there. 
I mean, what's going on in this family? Rebecca knows, Jacob knows, Esau knows, and Isaac doesn't know? Apparently not. Or did he forget? Well, maybe. He probably didn't know. He lived another 50 years. So he wasn't on his de deathbed yet. Go ahead. Rebecca heard the words of Isaac, and she remembered the words of the Lord. The elder shall serve the younger. And she knew that, ja that Esau had lightly regarded his birthright and sold it to Jacob. She persuaded Jacob to deceive his father, and by fraud received the blessing of his father, which she thought could not be obtained in any other way. Jacob was at first unwilling to practice this deception, but finally consented to his mother's plans. Okay, and I'm going to halt there for just a second and ask a question. What other ways could God have arranged for Jacob to get the birthright? Yes, Gordon. I was just thinking about this as we were coming here, and um, thought, you know, maybe if they'd fought, if Isaac and Rebecca had and Jacob had followed God's plan, Isaac, pardon me, Esau might have been killed out in the hunt. Yeah. You know. Okay. Problem solved. That's a problem. Or maybe uh, Esau would have died soon thereafter. Mm-hmm. Well, it, by one, by yeah. one means or another, whether it's on another hunt or whatever. When you get way to the end of the story, after all the squabbling back and forth and the threats and all the rest of that, Jacob ended end up getting the spiritual birthright and Esau ended up getting the money. So everybody's happy. Everyone got what they wanted. Well, Continuing on, no, quoting again from Ellen White, No sooner had Esau departed on his errand than Rebekah set about the accomplishment of her purpose. She told Jacob what had taken place, urging the necessity of immediate action to prevent the bestowal of the blessing, finally and irrevocably upon Esau. I wonder what they're going to say about this story when we ask them in heaven. And she assured her son that if he would follow her directions, he might obtain it as God had promised. Jacob did not readily consent to the plan that she proposed. The thought of deceiving his father caused him great distress. He felt that such a sin would bring a curse rather than a blessing. But his scruples were overborne, and he proceeded to carry out his mother's suggestions. Now, let's stop here for a second. How old is Jacob at this point? Was it 70 or 60? 70. Jacob, maybe maybe a year or two, before, I don't know how long it was before Jacob finally left, but by the time he left and went, traveled to Haran, he was 70. It's it's good a, huh? It's yeah. a good age. Huh? It's a good age. Yeah. Did he have a little too much mild in his temperament? <laughs> well, it didn't seem like it later in his life. By the way, we should probably mention that the, what Dwayne read was from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, and yeah. what you're reading is uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, same story. Yeah. yeah, okay. His scruples were overborn, so even though he was 70 years old, he listened to his mother, and he proceeded to carry out his mother's suggestions. It was not his intention to utter a direct falsehood, but once in the presence of his father, he seemed to have gone too far to retreat, and he obtained by fraud the coveted blessing. Jacob and Rebekah succeeded in their purpose, but they gained only trouble and sorrow by their deception. God had declared that Jacob should receive the birthright, and his word would have been fulfilled in his own time had they waited for him to, uh, to work for them. I mean, it's possible that God just could have prevented Isaac from giving the blessing to Esau. That's another possibility. But like many who now profess to be children of God, they were unwilling to leave the matters in his hands. Rebecca bitterly repented the wrong counsel she had given her son. It was a means of separating him from her, and she never saw his face again. From the hour when he received the birthright, Jacob was weighed down with self-condemnation. He had sinned against his father, his brother, his own, his own soul, and against God. In one short hour, he had made work for a lifelong repentance. This scene was vivid before him in after years when the wicked course of his sons oppressed his soul. And that's Patriarchs of Prophets, 
page 180, paragraphs 2 and 3. So I have a question mm -hmm. or another proposal here. So it wasn't long before, well, it was a long time before this that Abraham was out of the, almost out of un, very unexpected stop from slaying his son. Mm -hmm. And now God could have done the same thing with Isaac and Jacob, mm -hmm. Isaac and Esau and Jacob. Yeah, it could have. There's another possibility. There, God has lots of ways he can do things. Yeah. So I get the question, what kind of communication was going on in this family? Was Isaac the only one who did not know that Esau had sold his birthright? I mean, potentially Esau could have come in and if he were honest and on God's side, he would have said, God, I'm, I mean, Father, I'm sorry. I, I sold my birthright to, to Jacob. You need to give the birthright to him. Wouldn't that have been something? <laughs> anyway, it is difficult to know if Isaac was really completely deceived by all the actions of his wife and Jacob. He was obviously suspicious. You know, he said, well, are you really Esau? In any case, he proceeded to bless Jacob. Review carefully the role of each of the four participants in this saga. Isaac, Rebekah, Esau, and Jacob. Were any of them truly innocent? Review the deeds, the character, and the motives of each of the participants. Look at all the lies and deception involved. What does that teach us about human nature in general and God's grace? Okay. What do we know about Isaac? Is that my turn? No, it's Carrie. Sure. Go ahead. I'll, I'll read it. And this is dealing with Isaac, did not consult with his wife, did not recognize the true character of his sons, ignored God's word, and tried to defeat God's plan. Okay, and then Rebecca? Assumed she understood God's will, argued with the husband, planned deceit, ran ahead of God, and schemed with Jacob to deceive her husband. And we get to Esau, despised the birthright, did not care about spiritual matters, lived for the moment and chose to ignore God's promise. Esau grew up loving self-gratification. Now this is from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets 177. Go ahead. Esau grew up loving self-gratification and centering all his interests in the present. Impatient or restrained, he delighted in the wild freedom of the chase and early chose the life of a hunter. Yet he was the father's favorite. The quiet, peace-loving shepherd, Isaac, was attracted by the daring and vigor of this eldest son, who fearlessly ranged over mountain and desert, returning home with game for his father and with exciting accounts of his adventurous life. And that's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 177, paragraph 2. Jacob lied, schemed, envied, ran ahead of God, deceived his father, and stayed more at home. And again from Ellen White. Jacob, thoughtful, diligent, and caretaking, ever thinking more of the future than the present, was continue, content rather to dwell at home, occupied in the care of the flocks and the tillage of the soil. His patient perseverance, thrift, and foresight were valued by the mother. His affections were deep and strong, and his gentle, unremitting attentions added far more to her happiness than did the boisterous and occasional kindnesses of Esau. To Rebecca, Jacob was the dearest son, and that's again from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 177, paragraph 2. Fearing for his life, Jacob fled from the presence of Esau and his parents, never to see his mother again. Jacob must have wondered what his future would be like and what would be his relationship to God if he fled from Canaan. I want you to notice this a very important principle we're going to mention here. It was the belief of many ancient peoples that different gods were assigned to different territories on the earth. Jacob may have wondered if he fled to Haran and to the house of his uncle Laban whether he would still be able to receive God's blessing. Certainly, Isaac would have been, would have taught him the truth. So, I, was, I mean, you, you, those kind of ideas were very common 
might impact people's thinking. But very soon on his journey, he had the experience where he slept, on the slept in the wild with the stone for a pillow and had the famous dream of Jacob's ladder. Dwayne? Jacob left Beersheba and started towards Haran. At sunset, he came to a holy place and camped there. He lay down to sleep, resting his head on a stone. He dreamt that he saw a stairway reaching from earth to heaven with angels going up and coming down on it. And there was the Lord standing beside him. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac, he said. I will give to you and to your descendants this land on which you are lying. There will, they will be as numerous as the specks of dust on the earth. They will extend their territory in all directions, and through you and your descendants I will bless all the nations. Remember, I will be with you and protect you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done all that I have promised you. Jacob woke up and said, The Lord is here. He is in this place, and I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, What a terrifying place this is. It must be the house of God. It must be the gate that opens into heaven. Now I'm going to interrupt for a second. Do you think Jacob was really frightened? Or was this an awe-inspiring place? Was he awed by not ODD'd, but A-W-E'd? <laughs> I think he was awed by the experience. Yeah. I mean, seeing, yeah. the, seeing angels, seeing God, uh, apparently seeing a connection between what he's doing on earth and what's going on in heaven, seeing a physical ladder Amazing. in his dream, in his vision. Okay, what happened next? Jacob got up early next morning, took the stone that was under his head and set it up as a memorial. Then he poured olive oil on it to dedicate it to God. He named the place Bethel. The town there was once known as Luz. Then Jacob made a vow to the Lord. If you will be with me and protect me on the journey I am making and give me food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then you will be my God. This memorial stone which I have set up will be the place where you are worshipped, and I will give you a tenth of everything you give me. Wow. Well, wasn't God already his God? Yes. But, so, uh, should he have, I, I guess it really should have said, then you will continue to be my God if you mm -hmm. return me safely to my father's home. Yeah. So. Really, that would be more correct. Because, I mean, if, if he left and he was uncertain about his future, yeah. going to this new place, as, as you suggested earlier, then I think this was a reassurance and a, a recommitment. Yeah, I think very appropriate. Well, what kind of circumstances might lead us to do something like that today? And none of us have probably had a dream in the night with ladders going up and down to heaven. I mean, this is a pretty awesome kind of thing to happen to somebody. Well, we don't get to experience those things very often. In this dream, Jacob sees an extraordinary ladder that is connected with God. The same Hebrew verb, I'm going to let you say that. Natsav. Natsav is used to refer to the ladder that is set up, Genesis 28, verse 12. And the Lord who stood... Genesis 28, 13, as if the latter and the Lord were the same thing. So but now let me interrupt there for a second. In the other, later in the Bible, we're going, to, we're going to actually hear that somebody is a ladder, is a bridge or a ladder. Who is it? Do you remember? I remember it, but I don't remember who. Jesus is the ladder. And he said to Nathan, remember, I mean to Nathaniel, I saw you under the tree. And what did Nathaniel said, oh, you must be, you must be the Messiah. And he says, if you think this is something, you're going to see angels of heaven descending and descending. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, the latter is linked to the attempt at Babel to reach heaven. Like the Tower of Babel, the latter is to reach the door of of he the door of heaven. The, uh, excuse me. 
But while the Tower of Babel represents the human effort to go up and reach God, the Ladder of Bethel emphasizes that access to God can be achieved only through God's coming to us, not through human effort. So one, one is an attempt to go up and reach to God, and the other attempt is, is God coming down to reach us. Okay? As for the stone on which Jacob put uh, his head and had his dream, it seems to be a symbol of Bethel, the house of God, Genesis 28, 17, compared with Genesis 28, 22, both of which we just read which points to the temple, the sanctuary, the center of God's saving activity for humanity. It's from the Bible study, the adult okay. Sabbath school Bible study guide from okay. Monday, May 22. The phrase, gate to heaven, gate of heaven, which occurs only here in Genesis 28:17, in the entire Hebrew Bible is reminiscent of the name Bab El, mm -hmm. that okay, yeah. gate of God, and thus uh, of the vain in enterprise of the men of Babel who never reached the gate of heaven. The phrase, the gate of heaven, parallels the phrase, the house of God, which refers to the place that is the stone in Genesis 28, 18, and 19. This place, in turn, is the earthly spot of the ladder. Genesis 28, 12, of Jacob's dream. Therefore, the heavenly counterpart of the earthly house of God, the gate of heaven, points to the heavenly abode or temple sanctuary. Now, well, that's a lot of yeah. a lot of stuff talking about there. I think I'd have to string that through to... Yeah, exactly. Well, I want, to, I want you to just imagine in your mind for, for a moment, Jacob came back to this spot to camp here with his flocks many times later in his life. Try to imagine him telling his children, I slept right here, I put my head on this rock, and God's ladder came down to this earth right here. I think that would be quite, a, yeah. quite an experience. We sing a song about climbing Jacob's ladder. Oh yes, as a young person. The story about Jacob sleeping in the wild with the stone for his pillow is quite familiar. Hopefully you're all familiar with Genesis 20, verses 10 through 22. Contrast the experience J Jacob had on that occasion with the story of the B Babel builders in Genesis 11, 1 to 9. Gordon? So from the uh, Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, the lesson of Bethel is that a connection exists between heaven and earth, and that this connection is Jacob's ladder, which is God himself. So Jacob takes one of the stones he has placed around or under his head, a stone that was associated with his extraordinary dream, and erects a pillar from it. The Hebrew word for pillar, matzibah, mm -hmm. standing, <clears throat> which refers to the standing stone, echoes the words matzib and nitzab, which designate respectively the standing ladder and the standing God. Jacob anoints the stone to signify its consecration as a monument, thus conveying a spiritual lesson. This stone recalls the lessons of Jacob's ladder and the heaven-earth connection. In contrast to the name Babel, which recalls the vain attempt of the men who never reached the door of God, Bethel affirms that we are in the house of God. The men of Bethel entertained the ambition to reach and penetrate the palace, the place of God, in order to take God's place. The lesson of Bethel is that access to God can be achieved only through God's gift, through His grace and incarnation, through the ladder of Jesus Christ. Okay, once again, just to remind us, it should be clear, although there's a lot of fairly complicated language there, but. The idea is that salvation comes because God chooses to offer it to us. There's nothing we can do that sort of says, places God under obligation. Okay, God, you owe me this because I did such and so. And there's no way we can go up there like the people in the Tower of Babel trying to build a thing and find God somewhere up there. So it is, salvation is completely a gift from God. 
It is interesting to note that Jacob, after the vision of the ladder from heaven, promised to give a tithe to the Lord. This was not because he was hoping for additional blessing from God, but rather because he was thankful for what God had already given him. And here we have from our Bible study guide again, because God is in the because God is the God who cares about and takes care of Jacob's physical needs, and because God is the source of all he has, Genesis 8, 28, 22, Jacob responds by pledging to give his tithe to God. The biblical text does not indicate that Jacob fulfilled his two vows regarding the sanctuary and tithe. Only God's part of the deal is recorded in the book of Genesis. Jacob will acknowledge God's part when he refers to his experience of God's protection, Genesis 35, 3, compared with Genesis 46, 3, and 4. Later, Israel's building of the sanctuary, the sign of the worship of God of heaven, and the institution of the tithe, the sign of the recognition of the God of the earth, suggests that Jacob also fulfilled his vows. From our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page one, or the Teacher's Guide 121. So, Again, the same idea. God chose to be a part of the children of Israel later by having them build him a sanctuary right in the middle of the encampment. That's where it was supposed to be most of the time. And also God has come down to us. A very important point. The Bible study guide uses the phrase by pledging to give his tithes to God. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that he was giving a tithe to somewhere else before? or it doesn't tell us anything about that so we just don't know okay jacob thought to gain a right to the birthright through deception but he found himself disappointed he thought he had lost everything his connection with god his home and all and there he was a disappointed fugitive but what god, what did god do he looked upon him in his hopeless condition he saw his disappointment and he saw there was material there that would render back glory to god no sooner does he see his condition than he re represents the mystic ladder which represents jesus christ so god looks down he sees our condition and he reaches down okay here is a man who has lost all connection with God and the God of heaven looks upon him and consents that Christ shall bridge the gulf which sin has made. We might have looked and said, I long for heaven, but now can I reach it? I see no way. That is what Jacob thought. And so God shows him the vision of the ladder and that ladder connects earth with heaven with Jesus Christ. A man can climb it for the base rests upon the earth and the topmost round reaches into heaven. And this is in Ellen White's comments found in the Bible, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1093, but also in Christ's Triumph at page 86, verses 3 and 4. Finally, Jacob arrived safely at the area of Laban. What was his first experience there? Jim? Genesis chapter 29, verses 1 to 14. Jacob continued on his way and went towards the land of, east, land of the east. Suddenly he came upon a well out in the field with, the, with three flocks of sheep lying around it. The flocks were watered from this well, which had a large stone over the opening. Whenever all the flocks came together there, the shepherds who would roll the stone back and water them, then they would put the stone back in place. Jacob asked the shepherds, My friends, where are you from? From Haran, they answered. He answered. He asked, Do you know Laban, my grandson of Nahor? Excuse me. Do you know Laban, grandson of Nahor? Yes, we do, they answered. Is he well? He asked. He is well, they answered. Look, here comes his daughter Rachel with his flock. Jacob said, since it is still broad daylight and not yet time to bring the flocks in, why don't you water them and take them back to the pasture? They answered, we cannot do that until the, all the flocks here, flocks are, are here. here and the stone has been rolled back, then we will water the flocks. While Jacob was still talking to them, Rachel arrived with the flocks. When Jacob uh, saw R Rachel with his uncle Laban's flock, he went to the well, rolled the stone back, and watered the sheep. You're making an impression here, right? 
Then he kissed her and began to cry for joy. He a told big her. Impression. Mm -hmm. He told her, "I am your father's relative, the son of Rebecca." She ran to tell her father, and when he heard the news about his nephew Jacob, he ran to meet him, hugged him, and kissed him, and brought him into the house. When Jacob told Laban everything that had happened, Laban said, Yes, indeed, you are my own flesh and blood. Jacob stayed there a whole month. Good news, Bible. Okay, now when I read this story, these two places are somewhere in the range of 500 miles apart. Okay, now if you study ancient literature, you find out that there is what they call a fertile crescent that goes from Persian Gulf all the way up to Mesopotamian Valley, across almost to southern Turkey, maybe part of southern Turkey, and then down along the coast, and then all the way over to Egypt. And this, there was, there was business that went back and forth. So do you think that these two families had had any contact at all, any messages, any, you know, this was in the days of um, getting on the internet and sending an email. Um, do you think they had any contact between these two times, or was this were they completely cut off? Sounds like they may have been pretty much cut off, but yeah. uh, not much contact anyway. Yeah. If they did find something, it would be, you know, well, there was a big earthquake up such and such a place, or something like that, probably, that people would know about, perhaps. I don't know. Jacob agreed to work for seven years. So he says, you can't just stay here and work for me without being paid. Jacob agreed to work for seven years for the privilege of marrying Laban's beautiful daughter, Rachel. At the end of that time, somehow, he was deceived into marrying Leah, the older daughter. A week later, he was allowed to marry Rachel under the condition that he would work seven more years for Laban. It is hard to imagine from our modern Western perspective how this could have happened. Were both Leah and Rachel a part of this deception? Or was Rachel confined somewhere without having a chance to speak to Jacob about what was being planned? I mean, you know, uh, speak from a lady's perspective. David Noel Freeman thinks that they, that they tricked uh, Laban, that the two... They tri the, tricked Jacob, you mean? Yeah. No, the Jacob and Rachel and Leah tricked Laban. They 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 were all part of it. Uh, that's really? one. That's one. Yeah, that's one one person's. Uh. Wow. <laughs> I can't imagine Jacob Rachel. had to have known this tradition. Did and you would have thought if that Leo was a real tradition wasn't married. So why would he think he could? Because he'd worked for seven years for it already. So, you know, I'd always had the impression that, you know, here is beautiful young Rachel and here is ugly old Leah. Mm -hmm. But the Good News Bible says that Leah was beautiful and shapely. No, Rachel was beautiful and shapely. You know, I, I think it said Leah also. I, I may, okay. I, that's how I read it anyway. I may, okay. have, may have misread it, but, you know, so. Um, well, the question is, where was, where was Rachel? At Leah's wedding. Yeah. And she was best made. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Pride's made. This is just a vehicle for speculation. <laughs> okay. Well, we need to keep going. Was Jacob drunk? Though Jacob was a deceiver, he himself was a deceived. How can we learn to trust God when we don't see justice being done, when we see people who do evil get away with it, or when we see the innocent suffer? That's from our adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, May 24. There are, there are the times, uh, these, I'm sorry, these are the times when it is most important that we have the larger, great controversy view of history, and we can see the end from the beginning, and that the final results will be correct. Dwayne? Jacob understands now what it means to be the victim of deception. Ironically, God teaches Jacob about his own deception through Laban's deception. Although Jacob, as deceiver, from Genesis 27, 12, knows well what deception means, he is surprised when he is the victim of deception. Thus, he asks the question, Why have you deceived me? Genesis 29, 25 which shows that he knows deception is wrong. Yeah, and Ellen White told us that back in the beginning, didn't she? 
Then Leah began to have children, six sons arriving one by one, along with a daughter. Four of the four other sons were born to Jacob's two concubines. So here's four, two wives and two concubines, and everybody's having sons except Rachel. Sorry. Come on, stop that. Twenty-four. You know what would you what would what, how would you feel about that point in time? Well, at the end of those 14 years of working for Laban in order to marry his daughter or daughters, Genesis 29, 15 says what? Laban said to Jacob, you shouldn't work for me for nothing just because you are my relative. How much pay do you want? This was followed by those very unusual negotiations between Laban and Jacob about what kind of animals Jacob should receive as his payment for working for Laban. You remember it's a question of, okay, will you get the black ones, will you get the spotted ones, will you get the striped ones, and da-da-da-da. And supposedly the idea was they thought that if you separate them, then all this group is going to be over there and it'll be clearly who belongs, all belong to him. And this other group is over here, but it didn't work out like that. After the 14 years of working for Rachel and also Lee, his negotiations with Laban led to six more years of working for him. So worked for him for how many years altogether? 20. 20 years. Up until age 90? Yeah. 70 to 90? Mm-hmm. Receiving sheep and goats as his payment. During this time, he fathered 11 sons and one daughter. Believe it or not, most of them will have their names written on the gates of the New Jerusalem. I mean, are all the mothers going to be there too? That was one of the questions I was thinking as I studied this lesson. Will they stand beside their gate and welcome us in? <laughs> and if they do? <laughs> and if they do. Do you think God was involved in preventing Rachel from getting pregnant? I was going to say, I, it seems like maybe he had his thumb on the scale. Or was it the devil? <laughs> well, who was involved in helping Leah to have many sons? The same culprits, huh? In ancient times, children were regarded as a blessing from the Lord. They had no explanation for why one woman could have multiple children, another woman, another could not. Think of the story of Sarah and later Hannah. What do we say today when a woman can't have children? Yeah. Now we have a little better idea. There's, yeah. you know, there's specific reasons. Yep. And we go to all sorts of lengths to make sure we can solve the problem, yeah. right? The stories of the children being born to Jacob are recorded in Genesis. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. It's so easy, easy to bump on this little device here. The stories of the children being born to Jacob are recorded in Genesis 29, 31 to 30, 22. And it's a long story. Um, God opened Leah's womb. Is that yours, Gordon? No, you just did. God opened Leah's womb and she had a son, Reuben, whose name contains the verb raha, which means to see. Because God saw that she was unloved by Jacob, Genesis 29, 31, this child was compensation for her in her pain and suffering. All of this, by the way, comes from the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday. In addition, she receives, she gives the name of Simon, which contains the verb shama, heard, to her second son, because God has heard the depth of the humiliation of her pain and thus had pity on her just as he had heard Hagar's affliction in Genesis 29, <clears throat> Leah's son Simeon also will resonate with the name of Hagar's son Ishmael, which means God will hear, Genesis 16, 11. When Leah gives birth to her last son, she calls him Judah, which means praise. Leah does not refer to her pain or even her blessing anymore. She just focuses on God and praises him for his grace. I'm going to interrupt there for a moment. There's a lot of similarities. I mean, this, this, the author here talks a lot about how, okay, this same word is used here and this same word is used there. With a relatively limited vocabulary, 
should we be surprised at that or is that just automa almost automatic? Anyway. We have just two and a half minutes. Do yeah. You wanna, can, you wanna summarize what you want? Yeah, well, that's what I was just gonna say. Go ahead. Strangely, it is not only Leah, it is not, it it's is only, only when Leah cannot give birth again that God remembers Rachel and opens Rachel's womb, Genesis thirty twenty two. Rachel, the loved wife, had to wait seven years after her marriage and 14 years after her betrothal to Jacob to give her first son, Genesis 29, 18, and 27. She gave him the name of Joseph to signify that God had taken away my reproach and shall add to me another son, Genesis 30, 23, and 24. However wrong some of these situations were, God was still able to see, to use them, even if he didn't condone them in order to create a nation from the seed of Abraham. Again, from the Bible Study Guide for yeah. Wednesday. Okay, we're gonna move on here quickly. Was that ever a part of God's plan for Jacob to have Leah as his first wife and all those different children, and yet God is gonna put their names on the gates of heaven? Wow, at the birth of Rachel's first son, Joseph, Jacob finally reached the 14th year of his service to Laban and now considers leaving Laban in order to return to the promised land. But Jacob is concerned about providing for his own house. And so what do we have? After the birth of Jacob, of Joseph, I'm sorry, Jacob said to Laban, let me go so that I can return home. Give me a wife with my wives and his children and so forth. Uh, Jacob's blessing. When Jacob proposes a deal that all the speculators spotted, and we don't have time to deal with all those different things, dropping down here about the different animals and how they pre how they chose whatever and how how what factors might have affected that. Uh, I think it's probably was I think it was clearly God's act. I don't think it has anything to do with uh, some physical characteristics of some sticks that were stuck in the ground or anything like that. In what ways does this story reveal that God's purposes will be fulfilled in heaven and on earth despite human foibles and errors? Well, we don't have time to read Genesis 30, 25 to 32. It is interesting that Jacob was so willing to cooperate with Laban's plans. It's important to notice that Jacob was waiting for God's directions for his life. So uh, we know the, the conclusion of this story. Finally, Jacob felt it was time to leave and he left really without Laban's permission. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for these stories which uh, we have presented here in Scripture. May we learn the lessons we should learn from them. May we not make the mistakes that they made. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.